Welcome back to another episode of Right Here in Mass. Today's guest is Chris Wong, a certified executive coach who brings a wealth of experience and expertise to the world of leadership and learning and development. As a licensed therapist and leadership development professional, Chris has created multiple leadership and career development initiatives, fostering a strong leadership pipeline in nonprofit organizations. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Great to meet you, Ashley. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm excited to have you here. And I'd love if you could start off by sharing with our listeners more about yourself and what you do. Yeah, sure. So right now I'm a licensed or a, uh, I'm a licensed therapist also currently, uh, but I work as an executive coach. I started my own business probably in August of this past year. So just only a few months. I'm still young. Um, but yeah, I'm more, I just started my own business and I have been learning development for quite a while. I've been in leadership development and organizational development. And so now I'm just doing my own thing and just trying to have a bigger impact in the world. Love it. And so that's interesting that you just recently started your business. I'd love to hear kind of what your background is. Of course, you mentioned you're a licensed therapist, but I'd love to hear more about your background and then what ultimately inspired you to start your business and really shift into this new exciting journey in your career. Yeah, absolutely. I So I was a licensed therapist. I, I worked as a licensed therapist 10 years ago. Um, but I got burned out doing the work. I was doing uh, really intense work at a residential treatment center, got burned out, wasn't sure what to do, but I love teaching. I love coaching. So I got into learning and development and I love that work and the natural evolution of that for me, at least just because I wanted to have a, as big an impact as possible was moving into leadership and organizational development. So I was doing that at a nonprofit here in, uh, in the Boston area, love the work I was doing there. And just being able to have a bigger impact. And then I got actually laid off in June. Uh, so that's what led me to, after some reflection, thinking, I want to continue having an impact. I want to continue working with mission-driven organizations, uh, make the world a better place, essentially. And so I just decided doing it on my own is better, uh, better for me so I can have a bigger reach to the world around me. Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like Although, of course, very unfortunate that getting laid off did end up inspiring you to do something really awesome. And so I love that you found kind of like a difficult situation and turned it into a really positive experience for yourself. I think that's the that's the theme of kind of all my job changes. You know, I got burned out from being a therapist, didn't know what to do um, because it's I'm still, you know, paying off loans because of it. You know, it's a pretty mm. good commitment to do that thing. And lots of people even work for a long time to get to that point. And so it's a, uh, I've had to shift multiple times in my career and learn the the value of kind of continuing to look forward and not being stuck too much into what's already happened, uh, but building on that and using it to grow and, and to inform what I can do in the future. Definitely. And so with this being your really first jump into having your business, I'd love to hear what it was like to just the, go through the process ultimately of starting a business finding clients, how you were able to kind of transition into that entrepreneurial mindset and really everything that you've done along the way to help keep things moving. Yeah. So as a child of immigrants, I've always been taught, have a steady job. Don't work for yourself. Work for somebody else. That way you have a steady paycheck, you provide for your family and all that. So I've never even considered having my own business or being an entrepreneur. Uh, but my wife, her dad has had his own business has her entire life. So she's actually used to that my, that lifestyle of kind of not a steady paycheck and kind of ups and downs and working for yourself. So I, I was, I'm fortunate that she works. She has, we get health insurance through her. So I didn't have to convince her that this is what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. She was already comfortable with it. It was really just convincing my own mindset of getting out of that, that kind of safety net or quote unquote safety net, what I was thinking. So Building it is uh, quite the adventure. So because I'm not used to it, I've had to learn all these new terms, all these features. And I think I'm fortunate that I have less overhead. So I don't necessarily have to worry about like a physical footprint and other kind of insurance related to that. But I still have to do other things, you know, because I'm providing a service. Mm. So it's been quite a journey. And just understanding I didn't have a client base that I already could build upon. I had to go out and start looking for new people. Um, so business development, sales, marketing, a whole new world that I had never done before uh, is is opened up to me. And I have to and I'm I like learning a new skill. So it doesn't phase me too much, but it's yeah. still hard. It's not easy. It's not you know, I don't I really pride myself on being a genuine person, creating authentic relationships. So it's learning how to fit 
all of that business development relationship stuff inside my mindset of wanting to create authentic relationships. Definitely. And it sounds like too, that, like I mentioned, almost the unfortunate piece of getting laid off, but it did give you the time, which is good. Cause that's one of the things that I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs who do have a nine to five simultaneously struggle with is just like, how do you simply balance the two? And so just being able to see all that you've done in the past few months, because as of for our listeners right now, this is the middle of November we're recording, just seeing mm. everything you've done through the past few months, it must have been amazing to have the opportunity to have the time on your hands to focus on all of these things and do all of the learning that you've been able to do in that time frame. Yeah, I, th- I think there's plenty of people who try to do it part time before you know while they're still working and they try to do it on the side um i don't know i i think by doing because this is my full-time thing and i can focus on it i think there's a different mindset for me certainly it's i have to succeed i can't just not do it i can't just right. take some time off or do whatever like you certainly have to take care of myself and have that work-life balance but there's a different mindset of i can't just let things go i have to really pursue this and i have to work hard. There's, there's that mindset of like, your back's against the wall and you have to succeed, um, which I think is helpful sometimes for some people to really be, feel that pressure of like, I can't just rest on my laurels. I can't take it easy. I have to actually press forward. Definitely. Definitely. And I love what you had mentioned earlier about uh, what your parents had kind of instilled in you as the idea of getting a job and having that steady paycheck is what will give you that security. But really, that's not always the case. And that's something Mm -hmm. that I had learned myself, too, where I always thought having to work for another company or something else, that's where I would get that great security. But ultimately, you're at the mercy of someone else. You're at the mercy of a bigger organization compared to for yourself, like you're in control of your destiny. So as long as you really like you've done, and like you've mentioned, put in the work, really being able to work hard every single day, and then be able to make changes as needed based on what's working, what Mm -hmm. might not be working, then you'll end up having the outcomes that you'd like to have at the end. Right, right. And so how long have you been doing it? Um, Just over seven years. Wow. So then what was that first year like for you as you were kind of uh, jumping out into your own? Yeah. So that was a little bit difficult because I actually was in college when I started my company. So I was Mm -hmm. like juggling college full time and trying to be a normal college student and having my business Mm -hmm. and everything like that. And so it was definitely a grind, I'd put it, where just nonstop, um, every single minute that I had was just dedicated to something, whether it was schoolwork or my business or anything like that. And so I always used to joke that I just truly didn't know what it meant to be bored because I just didn't have the time to be bored. (laughs) But ultimately, that's what ended up, I think, helping me to get into the position that I am in today and being able to take my marketing agency, which is what I do full time, um, full time once I graduated. And so I think just kind of like what you've done within your journey as well is just really putting your nose down and having that hard focusing work, I think will definitely help to bring you or help to keep you ultimately going full force through your business. Yeah. 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 That's absolutely right. Yeah. And so I'd love to hear more about the topics that you work with your clients on, because the, there are a few that you had shared, which I'll put in the show notes for listeners that I found to be really interesting, with the first one being navigating difficult conversations. I personally struggle mm-hmm. with this myself in my professional career, and I'm sure many, if not all of our listeners do struggle with this as well mainly because I never want to hurt the feelings of the person that I'm having the difficult conversation with. But it's also important to have that difficult conversation because that's how problems get solved. And that's how uh, the goals of the company get met ultimately. And so for anyone who's struggling with knowing that they might need to have a conversation, but not wanting to have a conflict come out of it, what advice would you give to them for just kind of navigating that? Yeah, I so I I that's how I actually got started. It was creating an online course around it, and I oh wow, I saw a need because people just have a hard time with difficult conversations, and yeah, you know me, I grew up not talking about emotions, so it's certainly hard for me as well to get into it. Uh, but I I think first of all the the first thing anybody needs to do if you're trying to navigate difficult conversations is you need to know what the outcome you're looking for is. Because a lot of times we get stuck on just the emotions of it. We and we get so focused on like how am I gonna navigate their difficult behaviors or my difficult behaviors, or what if they say something that upsets me, or what if I upset them? 
all these kind of things that go through our head in terms of what's happening. But first is we need to figure out what is the goal I actually have. And that gives a lot of clarity into figuring out what do I even need to say in the conversation? How do how can I set up the conversation so that we can both get the outcome we're looking for in it? Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, it's just, you know, reframing how we even look at conversations like that, uh, ways to to facilitate dialogue so that it's a, a two-way conversation and creating space for them to also feel comfortable because they're the other person in the conversation is also going to feel the same way. They're going to feel upset. They're going to feel that fight, flight, or freeze response. So it's it's really about on you, whoever is facilitating it, to create a safe space so that both people can be calm and engage in the conversation and dialogue respectfully. Yeah. Yeah, that's great advice. And I know personally for me, what happens is I always think of worst case scenario it's like Mm. what's going to be the worst case scenario that happens once I have this difficult conversation and that's why it brings so much anxiety and I imagine it's probably the same for many other people where their mind just instantly assumes that a terrible thing is going to happen once the conversation is happening even if even though it could end up being the complete opposite even though it could be an amazing very productive conversation but just kind of not instantly reaching towards the worst possible thing that could happen yeah. And I always say lean into that. Like some of us, some people are absolutely, you know, kind of plan all these like what ifs, the worst case scenarios. And that's not a bad thing. Just take that and say, what are, what am I going to do in response to that? If that happens, mm-hmm. what am I going to do? And that's the value. There's also value in practicing those things. That way, if it does happen, which may or may not, at least you'll feel prepared and you won't have to feel off balance if that thing happens. Yes, that's great advice. One thing I found personally that has, I feel like has worked for me in these instances is almost doing like, I don't know if this is the right term, but calling it like a compliment sandwich where with a team member specifically, if there's, there have been instances where previous team members, um, not necessarily were like not following through on their work, but more so not getting as much done as they should be, if that makes sense. And so Mm -hmm. what I try to approach it as is like, I love all the work that you're doing. Like, your content always amazes me. I do notice that we're falling a little bit behind on some deadlines. Let me know if there's something I can do to help. Like I try to almost like start with the good, maybe bring in what the problem might be and then close out with the good by offering some way to help. And I've found Mm. that that usually ends up helping, but it's kind of hard to just know, like, how exactly do you approach something like this? So it's so interesting to hear as an expertise yourself, what your thoughts are and what your recommendations are around that. Yeah, I uh, at the risk, I don't want to offend you. I actually am not a fan of the compliment sandwich. Yeah. I actually don't find it very helpful because people only hear that last, either they only hear that last part or they find that that's disingenuous. Uh, uh, yeah. And also, you know, sense. if we eat a sandwich, we're not eating a bread, ham, bread sandwich. We're eating just a ham sandwich. The most important part is that middle piece, that critical feedback you want to give. Mm. Um, there's, there is a formula that I like to use that's still straightforward. Um, and it gives people confidence, you know, just say specifically what they did and then what the impact of that was, like why it's important and then what the new behavior you're looking for is. Mm, yeah. That's also very straightforward, you know, and people want good critical feedback done well. They obviously they don't want to be criticized just like being told what they've done right. wrong, but, but people want guidance. They want to be able to do better. They don't want to be doing a bad job generally they want to be doing as good a job as they can yes that makes total sense and then that way there's no um instance where there might be misinterpretation or someone might not understanding it or like something slipping through the cracks so i think that's a much better yep. approach to take for anyone who's listening and might be in this situation themselves yeah yeah absolutely and i've i've come across so many leaders well-intentioned leaders who are just they're worried about giving too harsh of feedback or overburdening yeah. their employees and and really, this is the kind of thing that'll help build that relationship with your employee. And they, when done well, if it's done well, it, it can help build a relationship. Absolutely. And I'm guessing that you probably recommend doing it face to face in some fashion whenever possible. Would you say so? I would say so. I, yeah. I think that kind of conversation should be in person. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it also depends on your relationship and what the feedback is. If it's, you know, a typo in an email, you can probably <laughs> exactly. just the, edit in the email. Yeah. You know, if it's something a little more substantial, you might want to do it in person or at least, you know, on Zoom or virtually. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Which I think is a great point because, I mean, things get misinterpreted easily. People mm. 
do, might assume that there's a certain tone in an email or they might misinterpret how you phrase something. And so I think being able to, just from conversations I've had with people, being able to see someone's facial expressions and just hear their voice, I think can make things go a lot more smoothly in that sense. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, great stuff about navigating difficult conversations. Another thing that I know that you specialize in that also stood out to me was being able to focus on enhancing productivity within teams. And so I'd love to hear more about your recommendations for that and what you typically what might share with your clients for tips or anything like that. Yeah, a lot, a lot of it is or starts with just creating that shared vision. Does your mm. team even, is everybody rowing in the same direction, essentially? And that's, I think the biggest part is a lot of times leaders will assume the team or their division or their department or the, the entire organization, they'll assume everybody has the same goal, but that may not be the case. And so yeah. it's, it's important on the leader or the manager or whoever to get a temperature check. What is everybody doing and why are they doing it? Uh, and then if they need to be recalibrated, get them focused on that and then figure out what is getting in the way of that at that point, you know, trying to figure out, is it conflict? Is it there's too many competing priorities and we need to get stuff off people's plates? You know, are people just not, they don't have the skill set and they do need some training or some coaching or mentoring to get up there. So what is it that they don't have that they're, that's preventing them from getting that high productivity? Mm -hmm. With that, do you find that the hours that people work kind of relates to productivity? Like for background for our listeners before Chris and I started recording, one thing we were chatting about is how we both have the afternoon slump at two o'clock. And yep. so I think that for many people, the idea of working nine to five can feel not fully productive for them because it's not always when they're at their maximum energy level or when they have their head in the game, quote unquote, to be able to really have some deep work done ultimately. Mm -hmm. And so is that something that you kind of explore with your clients is kind of shifting the hours and focus leaning in more on those flex hours so people can choose the times to work where they feel they're at their best? Yeah. And I think one of the things that I, I try to um, focus on is employee engagement in this type of work is actually really individually focused as, as mm. more difficult and complex, it'll make everything. There won't be a one size fits all. So if you have a shift worker who needs to be there doing specific things for a specific number of hours, so like in healthcare, you know, a nurse needs to be there from this time. They're not necessarily right. flexing, like, right. They have to be there or any kind of frontline worker like that. So it's being mindful. Also, do you have a job that you can flex hours? So that, that's reasonable. You can flex hours. I've um, we, I've had a supervisor personally that gave us four day work weeks. You know, I know it's a big topic now, but I love that. It was great. Yes. But also I loved it because I didn't have kids at the time. And so I had more flexibility to work later in the day. I couldn't do that now. I have little kids, mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it would be impossible. And, you know, for me, flex hours worked great. So I, I, um, my kids get home like around four 30 ish. And so I would usually end the, the work day earlier at like four but then I would do more work later at night. And it wasn't a stressful thing for me because I knew at least during those other hours, I was be able to, I was able to focus on my family. Yeah. So part of that is, yeah, flex hours, understanding what works best for people, um, understanding what your team's good at also. So you, you know what are their strengths. So what tasks do they need, do they that fit really well with their strengths and their abilities? Um, or if there are areas of development they want to develop and what tasks can you give them? so that they can build up those skill sets with, along with coaching and mentoring. Right. And with this topic specifically of productivity, did you find that the need for honing in on it increased once the pandemic happened and once more companies started to normalize more remote work? Like, do you see a lot of this happening with more remote companies or remote uh, leaders compared to hybrid or in-person leaders? I'm curious to hear like what you've experienced with that. Cause I think that there's so many great things to consider around it. I I think it's been around for a long time. The idea of productivity, like mm. a lot of like best selling books and methods around productivity, have been around you know for a century or more. So I think it's always been an issue. How do people be more productive with their time, especially with if they have ADHD? I think yeah. what's yeah. changed is if people, if managers were previously used to managing just by looking or like managing by walking around, just by seeing what people were doing and suddenly they didn't have that ability, then it's a transition for them. I think that 
been more of a transition more so than anything else is I they can't focus just on how many hours somebody's sitting in the office. They have to learn how to manage by performance and outcomes, which I think is more useful anyway, because not every job necessarily takes 40 hours a week. So yeah. it's really more important to think about what's the outcome somebody's looking for and are they meeting those expectations? Yeah, that makes total sense. And with that, a lot of the organizations that you work with are in the nonprofit space. So mm-hmm. you had mentioned previously that before starting your own business, you did work for a nonprofit. And I'd love to hear what inspired you or nudged you to join the nonprofit sector and what you enjoy the most about being a part of it. I think I've always just wanted to help other people. And so that's why I got into um, as, as a licensed therapist, wanting to help other people. And so it's it's just been part of my professional work all the time. I want to do something good. You know, I've had opportunities to work at for-profit places, I guess, which aren't always bad. I should say I've had the opportunity to work at places that um, are like coffee shops or um, construction companies and they're important to the, you know, the world and society we live in. However, that's not what I want to to do in the world. So that's what I've always been drawn to is having an impact and helping the world and the people around me as much as I can. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And it goes to show, I mean, what everyone says is that when you feel passionate about the work that you do, it shows, you feel excited mm-hmm. to work and be able to, to be a part of all these different projects. And it just shows in all of the outcomes that you have with your efforts. And so I think it's so important to do something that makes you happy. I mean, I personally believe that not every day is going to be enjoyable. There's, of course, the ups and downs that come with any career. But I think overall, in the grand scheme of things, just doing something that you truly enjoy is what will make it the most memorable and the most impactful, as, as you shared throughout your career. Yeah. I, I remember I had a professor in uh, college who said, the worst day of vacation is always better than the best day of work, which I yeah. find, I agree. I resonate with that. That's true to me. <laughs> Um, But also you're going to be working for like 40, 50, 60 years of your life. Yeah. You might as well do something you enjoy for those. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great, great, great perspective on that. And with that too, with your experience in leadership, I mean, one of the most challenging things that can happen is that when someone becomes a leader for the first time and they just feel totally overwhelmed of not knowing how to manage things or how to see people below them, but then also have like this um, position and title themselves. And so it can be very difficult to step into those new waters or that new career journey ultimately. And so for anyone who's just kind of becoming a leader and learning to become comfortable with it, what advice would you have to give them? I would say take some time to reflect. I think it's important to think through what's your vision uh, for yourself as a leader? What do you want to accomplish uh, through the role that you have? And then take some time to reflect on kind of how you're going to get there. There's lots of great books on how to set up your first 90 days, which are really great. And I think you should, I think people should use those kind of frameworks as well. You know, who, what are key relationships you'll need to build? What are key, key skills you'll need to build up? Um, But also notice, I think the, the mindset of just knowing that it's going to be a marathon, not a sprint. So Mm. it's okay to go slow. It's okay to say you don't know. And really that builds more trust with your team. If you're a first time leading that team, it, they're going to trust you if you say that it's going to build credibility. If you just admit you don't know everything, you know, if you yeah. do know something even better, they'll, they'll love that, but they, they want that, that honesty and transparency also. So it's okay. So you don't know, say it's okay to go slow and take your mm-hmm. time to learn things and not make rash decisions, even though there's, especially the higher up you go, there's going to be lots of pressure to make those quick decisions. It's okay to go slow, especially when you're new, because the the as the higher you go, the impact of your decisions is just exponentially grows. Yeah. So it's it's a lot more costly to make a wrong decision. Right. And I love that reminder of being able to admit that you might not know the answer to something and it being totally okay if you don't know the answer to that. I feel like with, I mean, myself personally, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners can relate, I feel like there's pressure that you have to know everything. And especially when you're put on the spot and you're like, I don't know, it can feel very Mm -hmm. overwhelming. And so I think that's a really fantastic reminder is that you don't have to have an answer for everything right away, which is, which can be really daunting when you're in that position as it comes up. Right. Right. Especially if your team doesn't actually know the answer, you know, then you're going to feel more pressure to actually figure it out. Mm. But there's still an opportunity to say, I don't know, but let's figure out the answer together. Oh, yeah. 
That's a great perspective too. And I also love the opportunities where I get to learn from my team where they teach me mm -hmm. something that I had no idea. I think that's kind mm -hmm. of having that opposite effect ultimately is instead of teaching someone else, having them teach you, I think that is really powerful. And it's great to have people like that on your team who are so innovative and always learning themselves and always wanting to share best practices or anything like that, that can really help to further the rest of the company. I think that's a really great thing to have too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. And so for someone who's looking to improve how they are as a leader, what would you recommend in that sense? Like they've been a leader for a little bit, but they know that they have some things that they can improve and they won't really want to make sure that they're as best as possible for themselves, their team and the overall company. What advice mm -hmm. would you have to share with that? Well, work with me, number one. <laughs> absolutely. Outside of, that, outside of that, I think you could do uh, 360 assessments, just figure out where your strengths are um, from, from a variety of of people and then see what areas you want to grow but mm -hmm. also or i should let's take a step back i think it also still stems back to what's the vision for your role what do you want to be what do you want to grow to be what's your mission in life you know not necessarily with the position you want to get to but what's your why why do you do the things you do yeah examine that so you have more clarity and then you can figure out from there how are you going to get there mm -hmm. then you could get those assessments like a 360 or any other kind of assessment and figure out where your gaps to get to that point, you know, like, like any strategic plan, this same thing is just for your personal life. Yes, absolutely. And with that, I don't know if I'm totally correct on this, but I feel like I've heard somewhere that there's types of leaders, leaders, or like seven types of leaders or something like that. Is that something mm -hmm. that you believe in and kind of encourage leaders to learn what type of leader they are or I'm just curious because sometimes I feel like I read some of those types and I'm like I feel like I'm a mix of some some of these not necessarily just one but ultimately like a mix of a few so so to say yeah yeah I, I find it a little bit a little bit like horoscopes where people can kind of just see those things and say I, yeah. I see myself in this for sure <laughs> <laughs> they kind of see what they want to see I think a lot of the more um, robust research these days is really about how do you best meet the needs of your employees? And yeah. it means flexing. Some of them really do need much more direction. You know, it not like I, I love coaching just because it's my job, but not everybody needs to be coached. Some people just need to be told what to do and when to do it and how to do it. Right. Uh, and other people do. Some people need to be coached and mentored. Other people don't even want to grow. They don't want to build their skill sets. They're really awesome at what they do. And they're just happy doing it because they prefer to just pay for their personal life. They are they have other things going on in their personal life they'd rather focus on. Also, okay. And so I think the real key is you have to understand who your team is and who your organization is and figure out how you want to show up every day to them. Yes, absolutely. Makes total sense. And so a few of the specialties we've mentioned that you really work on with your clients include productivity and also including navigating difficult conversations. Could you talk more about what you specialize in when it comes to leadership and learning and development and types of situations that you might help your clients work through? Yeah. So I really focus on nonprofit leaders and really just looking to increase their influence and navigate difficult relationships. So if they're trying to implement a strategic plan and they get stuck into a roadblock, you know, I'll, I can help them with kind of figure out, do they need to build relationships, key strategic relationships? Do they just need better uh, operational principles and figuring out how to sustain that and execute that, uh, creating high performing teams? So uh, I've worked with some teams to just do 360s of all the members and figure out how they can work both individually and together better to, to just so that they can achieve more. So, and then conflict resolution, of course, um, I've, I've done lots of that as well. Just difficult conversations that need to happen. Yeah. Awesome. And would you say that you tend to gravitate towards one more than the others, or do you kind of love them all equally? I, um, I think just based upon the things I talk about and who I talk to, I think people tend to talk to me most about they're struggling with getting things done because of these, these difficult relationships across their organization. So mm. they're trying to lead a culture change, but there's so much resistance from, from the department below them, as well as from their own boss. And so now they're trying to navigate all these things and get people on their side, or they got this new strategic plan and they need from the organization and they need to execute that, uh, you know, for their entire organization. How do, how do we move things across to the finish line? 
So that's usually w- what comes my way the most. Yeah. And as you share that, I can totally see how your experience as a licensed therapist comes into play here, because I feel like that's something Mm -hmm. that really sets you apart and helps to provide that additional value to your clients is just having that component in addition to your executive coaching experience. I mean, one thing that I joke about with a few of my business friends is that sometimes we have like our therapy sessions together where we'll just kind of vent about things that are happening in business or just be able to kind of share what's on our mind or difficult situations that we're going through. And it sounds like that experience and um, expertise that you have comes in full force, the work that you do with your clients in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's natural. Um, Also, I mean, I spent a lot of money on it sometimes. (laughs) Might as well still use it. (laughs) I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to like just throw that away completely. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And so having started your company a few months ago, I'd love to hear where you see it going within the next year or even within the next five years. I mean, it sounds like you have a lot of big things planning and big things going on, which is very exciting. Yeah, I'd love to continue growing it. Um, I'd love to continue just expanding the impact I'm having, uh, getting out there. I had never considered this previously, but after talking and networking through a, through a lot of other uh, people, um, part of me is decide is wondering, is it worth kind of building my own coaching agency in the future? Interesting. Of, um, people who can of of uh, coaches who can work with mission driven leaders. Um, certainly, we're not the only ones out there. There's plenty of of them out there, but uh, I think there's it's an interesting direction to pursue. Um, but we'll see where it takes me. You know, yeah. I don't. I uh, personally don't plan too far ahead what the specifics look like. Um, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, I love that idea. And it's something similar that I did. I mean, I started out as just a freelancer with marketing, but then it got to the point where I was like, I only have so many hours in a day. There's only so many clients I can physically support. And it gets to the point where if you do want to be able to make a bigger impact and help more people, then having that team is crucial. And so I love that idea of being able to have like that coaching agency of bringing in professionals just like yourself to work with all these different leaders and organizations and support them with their goals. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll see. We'll see where the road (laughs) takes me. (laughs) Yeah, well, we'll have to follow up then once that happens so we can share more about it. Um, But as we get towards the end of this episode, Chris, one of my favorite questions to ask our guests is what their favorite local businesses are to support. So I'd love to hear what yours are. I've been thinking about this and I would love to talk about restaurants because I just Mm -hmm. love restaurants. And so I'm on the South Shore. I'm in Weymouth. Um, but a lot of my suggestions are more Quincy based. So uh, there's this place called Fratelli's. It's a bakery slash dessert. So good. Awesome. So, you know, so it's awesome. Yes. It's delicious desserts in Quincy. Uh, there's also this other restaurant, Fat Cat in Quincy. The most incredible mac and cheese I've ever had in my life. I love it so much. Um, I'm pre-diabetic now, so I can't have it as much as I want, <laughs> but I love it. And the portions are so huge. Oh, I just yeah. like I can't believe it. Um, so the, those are the two big ones that I uh, I I love, and I I would also I like um, Granite Telecommunications. They're not really most people listening to this podcast. I can't imagine like use their services. They're telecommunications, um, but I just love like my wife works for them, which is why I know. But uh, I actually love the leadership they have there, and mm. the the CEO is such a, such a nice guy, and they do so much charity. And a lot of it comes out of his own pocket, oh, partially wow. because he's this, he, I think he's a billionaire, but, um, but they just do so much because they really try to give so much back for cancer research or just other charities. Or I think he donated like a million dollars every week to a different nonprofit or charity That's last amazing. year. Um, so I just, I appreciate that about him. And he's such a nice guy that I've, I've met him a few times and he always remembers me. Um, so he's, it just seems down to earth. So I just really respect that company. I love that. Those are great shout outs. Chris, this has been such an awesome episode and I've really enjoyed having the opportunity to have you come on the show to share all about yourself and things that you do within your business. And now I'd love if you could share with our listeners where they can find you online in case they'd like to learn more and connect with you further. Yeah, it was great meeting you. Great talking here. I love talking about this topic. Uh, The best place to find me is probably LinkedIn. I am most, uh, I'm most active there. Uh, you can find me Chris Wong LMHC. Um, I do have a website, but I will tell you this that it's actually getting revamped right now. So exciting. You won't find anything, but it's myleadershippotential.com. 
Uh, you can find me there eventually once it goes live, probably at the beginning of December. Um, I'm not sure when this drops, but but you'll Perfect. see it there. Uh, and then you can always email me, myleadershippotential at gmail.com. Awesome. And I will include links to all of those places in the show notes so that way our listeners can click through and connect with you from there. But thank you so much again, Chris, for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me.